Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Fearless Training Raw Knowledge Podcast with your host, myself, Alex Connor, where we talk everything training, nutrition, and lifestyle collectively. And this week, I'm back with another guest, Ben Saravia. I do apologize, Ben, if I've pronounced that wrong. <laughs> um, I did my best to uh, enunciate it correctly, but uh, please correct me if that's not quite right. And we're talking resilience this week. Speaking of which, it's been a huge week. It's been a massive week. I do apologize for the delayed upload on the podcast, but as they say, better late than never. But anyway, back to Ben. And we're talking resilience. So designing cutting-edge executive well-being programs that focus on resilience to maximize performance is what Ben specializes in. His resilience coaching deconstructs what the latest science reveals to us about personal resilience that highlights the most effective strategies you can implement today to allow you to function more effectively, smoothly, happily in an unpredictable world, which I think we can all relate to. And we divulge a lot of the personal anecdotes and stories from Ben's life as well within this conversation. And I think a lot of you will relate and be able to understand some of the perspectives and some of you will be able to empathize in many ways than others. So the resilience coaching that Ben offers is designed specifically for people in leadership roles such as HR to CEOs, those that are more likely to be mentoring and coaching others than to be receiving this crucial support themselves. And this was a really interesting conversation. Ben is someone that I met through the gym and we struck a chord initially being from the UK and then we got to talking and realized that we had a lot of ethics and philosophies and shared a lot of like-minded concepts as well. So it was only natural that eventually he would share some of his wisdom on the podcast. He's an extremely interesting gentleman. He's very talented. He's got a lot of wisdom and I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. So without further ado, guys, thank you as always, for all your support, make sure you download and share on any of your favorite podcast mediums. And I'll see you here again, same time next week with another amazing guest. But in the meantime, enjoy my conversation with Ben. Ben, thank you for joining me. Welcome to the Fearless Training All Knowledge Podcast. Happy to be here. It's a pleasure. Let's start off as we always do at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Give us a bit of a background, who you are, what you do, etc. Okay. Uh, like you said, my name is Ben. I've been um, I've worked in the fitness industry for about ten years, managing clubs and uh, doing personal training, all this sort of stuff that, that comes from that. Uh, but now I actually work with people to develop their personal resilience. So I'm talking about like human resilience. And um, what led me to get into that was I realised that a lot of people. So when we do training. Um, you know, we do it to look good or to, often to overcome some sort of problem. So when I, I noticed over 10 years, thousands of people coming in going, oh, I need to do some weight or I need to do something. And I realized it wasn't just from sort of vanity or physical health perspective, but that people are actually in, in many ways trying to improve their uh, personal strength. So if you're depressed or if you're something like that, and one of the first things that you can actually do is uh, build that. Is go to the gym or undertake an exercise routine. So that's not that's not. Um, I wouldn't say that's the breaking news, uh, but I realised it's one of the important things to sort of have a happy life. Yeah, um, it's got a bit of building blocks. Yeah, right? it's certainly a pillar, uh, but it's not the only thing. Correct. So that's what I do now. So I have a program called the Resilience Within, where we actually look at things and go, okay, because everyone's different. You might have bucket loads of one asset and not so much another um, and so I'll look at that and go where are, where are the areas that we can improve and I basically look at myself all the time as well not in a vain way a little bit but <laughs> <laughs> this fact didn't end up there itself yeah. um, but I always look at myself because I, I when I trained and I even competed and I got to a point where I'm like well look I'm, I'm in stage ready condition mm-hmm. um, yeah. I live in Australia I should be really happy yeah. and Oh no, <laughs> just find something else. And I realize I'm not really a strong character. I'm not a strong character. I would train myself to be all that I would want to be. So then I started looking at all these other things. Um, be it, you know, insert subject, nutrition, meditation, whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah. 
So having more of a, a well-rounded and a holistic approach. That's right. And we would do, would it be fair to say, then you help people fill those gaps that perhaps are not met by you know, training, nutrition, or whatever it is they're doing, but identifying where they may be falling down and where it's breaking down and helping them kind of rebalance, if you like, to have a more sort of, um, not, uh, what's the word I'm looking for now? Not just strategic, but they're a bit more uh, dynamic and, and versatile, if you will, rather than being very, say, good at one particular area, but then lacking in others. And then more eventually it sort of fall, always fall down. Yes, so you're right, and that's sort of holistic um, overview. Mm -hmm. So you want to address all of those things. Uh, but some people may need to, so if you look at the gym, it's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. I know guys and girls who are just in fabulous condition. Yeah. And yeah. they're like, um, you're self uh, uh But you, and then I've also seen them fall apart because they've put on a few pounds. Yes. <laughs> you know, or post, I had a friend of mine, uh, his name's Greg McKenzie, and he was 63 and he had a body that most 20 to 30 year olds would, would um, you know, be, be jealous of. He won a competition, um, I got silver. Um, in the Masters and a few months later killed himself. And this guy was an incredibly learned man. Mm. And he was very respected. So he had a lot of friends. He was in wonderful condition. Um, and he had intelligence and that didn't... Uh, though that wasn't enough. And when we talk about, when I talk about resilience, so it's not something that I've sort of... It's something I've become really passionate about. Um, because it's, it's not saying, oh, basically, um, Alex is a tough mother, you know? Yeah. You, you can throw anything at him. It's not about robustness. It's, um, and it's not about not failing. It's about the ability to actually come back from failure and, and learn from it. So, so if you take something like the pyramids of Giza, right? they're incredibly robust, which means it takes some hell of a, hell of a force to break them down, yeah. which is why they still stand. Sure. Uh, but if you did knock them down, they're never getting back up. Um, and resilience as a quality in, in human beings, um, or in a system or a business or anything actually for that matter, because it's very much an engineering term, it's, it's origin, yeah. Yeah. is an ability to bounce back or return to original form. So, oh shit happened, but there I am again. Somebody dies, it doesn't mean that you're like, that doesn't affect you, no, it affects you. You feel depression, you feel whatever it might be, or great sadness perhaps. But then, it, it, but then the ability to come to come back from that. So that's what's really important. And then when I started to realise, those are the things that people like I work with a lot of executives, and so they're incredibly able people. But they are not necessarily. Uh, you hear these these academics or uh, epidemics that say burnout. You hear that all the time about stress. And, yeah. and what are the reasons for that? Does it need to eat better? Do you need to? So you might need to work less. Go home, re-engage your family, your friends, build a network. Because these are all the, the pillars of resilient people. Mm -hmm. So when we look at someone who's a, who's, oh, he's a chewing for a um, breakdown or, or, or something like that, it's not often someone who has a massive network of friends. Not always, but not often. Mm -hmm. So we notice those people who are well integrated into communities. We see this in indigenous, indigenous people. So like the Maori communities in New Zealand, yeah, yeah. in Christchurch, following Christchurch earthquakes, now, um, they found that the ones, specific term, uh, but um, ones that were closer to their communities, indigenous communities, they responded much better. They, they shared, they had like people, like their own uh, networks, but individual Maoris who were disconnected from the networks but took a long, longer to recover or, or, or you know, destroy businesses or my home. So that, that's, what, that's what got me into it, uh, this sort of fascination with it, um, and the idea that it can be built. Um, so it's not just like, oh, he's that guy. And we know that, right? Like, people who are just like, man, he's amazing. And nothing gets the guy now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not me. Yeah. I'm not that guy. Uh, I, I, was, I was never that person. I was a sensitive child. Yeah. So I'm interested in building it, just like you can build muscles. Yeah. It's something that you can uh, adapt and with and develop over time. And I was going to ask you to define your, your definition of resilience, but I think you just touched, up, touched upon it. 
if there's anything more to add, please do. But what I'd like to delve into now is you briefly mentioned some of the character traits of resilience, mm -hmm. and then you used some real life examples. Mm -hmm. What are some uh, some more examples uh, for listeners and, and people wanting to improve resilience that you found really helpful? Maybe some some tactics and some strategies that people could do or even look out for because so you know, one of the first steps to achieving something often is becoming aware of it yeah. and then sort of building on that. So if you could allude to a little bit more of that, that'd be great. There are so many things, but you're quite right. Um, one of the one of the I think one of the most powerful things there are two things I would say. Uh, one of them would be um, the practice of mindfulness. And before, you know, and, and whatever that means to you. Um, but mindfulness in respects of being able to reframe what happens to you. So um, if you're if, if you're so if you were like I was, and, and I'm a, like as all I'm a working progress, but if you're like me, and often I would I would sort of, oh my god, why does this always happen to me? And so that doesn't actually invoke a lot of res resourcefulness, you know. What does that mean? Does that mean you're more likely to take action or you're more likely to go binge on Netflix and feel sorry and eat crap food? Right? Because that's the, that's the path of least resistance and that's what you might want to do uh, when something doesn't go your way. So if you can reframe things, um, so, so go, okay, you know what, when you look back, for example, on everything that's happened to you in your life, um, you have the benefit of hindsight then. And you can go, well, that happened and it was really awful at the time. And then this happened, you know? And then you go, oh, okay, I'm kind of happy that happened. I'm yeah. kind of glad that happened. Yeah. Um, someone who I really respect, well known, very easy to like, is Oprah Winfrey. And she was uh, sexually abused when she was a young woman. Mm -hmm. or, you know, young woman, older child. How are you? Yeah. yeah. Um, yet, it's not just the fact that she is a billionaire and all of these wonderful things, and she's helped so many people. She actually put into law, they call, I think they sort of call it the Oprah law. Right. Which was um, this register of child offenders and sort of that Bill Clinton put into place. So that is someone who took adversity and, and sort of, and instead of letting it become herself, become a victim, even though she was, mm -hmm. she has framed that, uh, these things to go, no, I will not allow these things to let me put me back. So what you were saying is tactics is one of those things is to actually develop some sort of mindfulness. So, so start questioning yourself. What is the story I'm telling? I think Brene Brown says, what is the story I'm telling myself? Well, this is the story I'm telling myself. Yeah. So when you go into a place or you, 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 you achieve something, or you, you start trying to do a project and it's not working, are you telling yourself, I'm a loser? Or are you telling myself, look, nothing's straight. <laughs> there are ups and downs and everything. So one is so much kinder to yourself. And one of the ways you can do that is by something like meditation. Meditation creates that, that, that gap between the thought and the action. Right? So when someone's tailgating you, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. And it's very annoying. I find that really annoying because it's dangerous and endangerment to my life, their life, other people. Yeah. It's unnecessary. It is. Right? Why is that? Especially English people. I think we have a certain, certain uh, culture around driving, which yes. is we, do, we, we line up and we drive in a certain way, yes. which wouldn't be tolerated. A lot of stuff you see here. Or, or, <laughs> we we'll would be tolerated for a minute. No, <laughs> no, 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 But here it's just, oh, yeah, season, right? Um, it, it's, um, anything goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it's that, that gives you that distance. So that is something that you can do immediately. Start trying to work on the way you look at things and frame things. Yeah, yeah. And if meditation works, you do that, or do yoga, or go for a long hikes. Turn off give yourself that space. That's, that's one. And the other one I'm sure you'll probably guess. Um, and that's physical training. <clears throat> I think for um, anyone who, if you don't know what to do, or you'll think, oh God, life gets to me, or whatever, and you don't have a, um, uh, and that's a podcast in and of itself. Yes. You do not have an established uh, physical routine. For me, I was 27 years old, smoking on my couch, feeling depressed. So, so we're covering that mindset, and then we we're talking about the second thing. The second thing that I would do, um, me personally, um, was, and you probably guess, it's about training. So, if um, it's simply no, there's simply no alternative to it. You, know, you can do everything you want in life, 
but if you're not undergoing some sort of physical, uh, deliberate physical training or have a very active lifestyle um, as an aside, then you really need to get into a gym, start walking, start doing something because this is basically your vessel. Um, and that's going to take you through life. And so if you, when, when you, no matter what it is, when, you, when life's adversities come to you, which they will, if you are in bad physical health, then it's going to be harder. It's not impossible, but it's going to be harder to, to tolerate. So in my case, um, I can remember, and, and I really feel like it changed, it's a bit of a cliche, but changed the trajectory of my life, was I was 27 years old. I had just come back from Spain, and Spain was a failed adventure. Into, uh, a failed adventure. I had said, oh, I'm going to go to Spain, and I'm going to live my life, and toodles. <laughs> and, uh, Peace out, y'all. Yeah, I'd uh, you know, lived in England by six years by then, and I, I didn't, didn't gel well with me. And, and I went to Spain, and I was there for three months, and, and my confidence just plummeted, you know. Hard, hard enough place to, to, to succeed in here if you're Spanish. Uh, Correct. So uh, I returned to the UK, and I'm very down about it, I'm quite depressed, I'm just living with my friend, my best friend, childhood friend, and I'm just sitting around watching Sky News and smoking all day. Uh, and, uh, and then one day he comes up to me and he's like, look, come on man, if you're not going to be doing anything, come to the gym with me. And it was something I never ever thought I would do. Uh, and I, uh, I, I, and I'm six foot three, and I weighed about 72 kilos, and if, if, if you know your weight to all height ratios, you know that's very underweight, that, that's looking a little bit like the a machinist. That is brilliant. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. I can show you any muscle in my body. Yeah. But you know, the, yeah. What was the old saying? It's like, uh, yeah. abs on the skinny guy doesn't hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like, yeah. 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 Um, but anyway, yeah. so. Yeah. so <laughs> Straight me. Yeah. One of my brother's favorite nickname for me. Uh, so I started when I was funny, you should say that. Because I, he always used to call Bean pole. Oh, uh, right. pole up. He's a good bloke, my brother. Yeah, it's he, all sad in jest. Yeah, yeah, but it was funny because I started going to the gym, right? So going with my gym, to the gym, so I had a gym bike, which is just it absolutely imperative for me. If you're not someone who's going to go, who's going to be intrinsically motivated, then extrinsic motivation is great. If you have someone who can take you along that journey, uh, you know, then that's fantastic. And he took me to the gym and I didn't like it. Um, and, but you know there's so many things that, that, that changed for me as I started to literally the, the achievement of going oh this week I benched 30 kilos because uh, that's all I had and then after a while 35 and then 40 within the microcosm of the gym you have um, small goals mm. you even do this set six more reps achieve, rest, repeat improve and then doesn't really matter who you are. Was the other thing I realised. But over time, you start to improve. You start to feel good. You start to walk in there, and everyone's like, "Hey, hey, hey!" You know, it's like the, the church or, or community centre. Yes, um, that's starting to happen to me now here, yeah. uh, and uh, that was also really good for me. And so, after that, uh, when you go and you need to apply for jobs, or you need to relocate to a new place, or you need something awful happens. If you're in good shape, and it doesn't mean being picture perfect, but if you're strong within yourself, then you're ahead of the game, you're ahead of most people. That's why that's so important. So if, and, and it's not that, because I know we talked about mindset and having that frame, it's not that you go put these two things in, in uh, two separate columns. It, 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 it makes stupidly linked. You can't really have robust mental health if you have very poor physical health, unless you're like the to master. Um, and it, you know, when they look at like experiments and stuff with say rats and all of that, and they put the rats on, on a, a same diet, two control groups, one rat has a load of other rats to be friends with, and the other rat's on its own. The rat that's on its own, despite having the same nutrients and all that, develops muscles slower than the one that has a social support network. So if you're not happy, or even a better word, if you don't have sort of a robust sense of self-worth, um, and, and then, or that, that mental fitness, then you can be as physically fit as you like uh, with, 
it's not going to, you're not going to be in balance, and vice versa is also true. So anyway, uh, the question was, what are the, what are the two big things for you? The two big things for me was, as we're starting to frame things differently, look at things differently, and also start moving. Yeah. You've got to get to gym, you've got to do something, or, you know, what suits you. That they got examples, but in sharing them, it's good because it highlights the relationship between the physical and the mental, and then that there does need to be some balance of some sort at some point. Because, as you rightly said, you can't necessarily have a lot of one without the other. At some point, there's quite a deal of the give and take. Can you give us some real life examples? You mentioned you work with some corporate clients and professionals, etc of resilience and how you help those peers and those people to achieve resilience within the confines of their environment and their adversities? Yeah, absolutely. So, interestingly enough, when you actually start to um, talk to um, entrepreneurs, startups, or people in high-level positions, if anything, there is a, uh, or leadership, leadership, um, so, there is a, it's, there's a greater requirement for that resilience per se, so the ability to take setbacks and then to return to, a, to, to maintain your core integrity and then move forward. So if you're the boss, uh, or you're the CEO and the, the results are in and they're not great, or you know, something doesn't happen or you've got a big presentation that day and they lose all the files, it is up to you uh, to, as a leader to actually display that, that sense of we shall overcome. So, in a way, there's greater pressure. And so, um, when, there's no doubt why you see a lot of these, uh, these uh, it's an epidemic, so to speak, of burnout. You hear burnout a lot now. Oh, burnout. I was killing it doing my 12, 15 hours a day, and then I burnt out. Well, firstly, you shouldn't be doing 15 hours a day. I think that's a, personally, I think that's a false economy. I think a lot of damage has been done by people saying, I you know, sleep when? When you're dead? No, no. Sleep. Yeah, that maxim will be true. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, you want to die, do not sleep. You well, there's another joke, isn't it? Uh, there was a joke I love with a guy sitting with his doctor, and he goes, Look, you've got two options. One, exercise an hour a day. Two, be dead 24 hours a day. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a nice way to be that. <laughs> um, but so, so we're working with that. Uh, we, some, some, what you'll find is that certain things are starting to, to, to be left to the wayside. Diet, nutrition, uh, sleep, uh, all the things that we know, uh, exercise, rest, uh, uh, framing. How important really is this? What is really important? What can you offset? What's the worst that can happen? Uh, I was working with a guy who uh, was getting calls up until 10 o'clock at night on a Sunday. I'm like, why are people calling you 10 o'clock at night on a Sunday? And uh, he's like, well, you know, because they really want to... And I'm like, look, where has this come from? Has this come from a place where you wanted to give, make sure that you were really good with your clients and you gave them everything they felt really sure? And he was like, yeah. So you have actually set the frame. You set the boundaries, or lack thereof, for people to be able to call you on something. So the first thing you need to be doing, is take up on Sunday night, maybe to to sleep, but just set those things while on Sunday to spend time with my family. So I couldn't go back to you, I was out with the family. And then start to, to, to set those boundaries. People will respect them. Uh, and so, yeah, so that's some of the things that, that I work with with people. And this, this, again, coming back to the framing of, look, I can put you in, in, in so I can make you a workout routine or something like that. But really, where are the biggest, the lowest hanging fruit? You know, that's what we go for. Uh, and that everyone is different. And that makes sense. I think, you know, keywords that we're using, reframing, mindfulness, is the glass half full, is the glass half empty? And there's always two perspectives, you know, we've always got a choice. Uh, it's like the yin and yang, the good, the bad, the, uh, you know, evil versus uh, the good guy, and all that kind of thing. We, we always see these, like, trifectas, and I think it's really important when you're working with people, or for us as humans to develop a critical mindset or a more three-dimensional or a multi-perspective rather than often very binary or looking at things from one perspective. And I think some of the things that we previously talked about is how there are persons on the planet who 
choose to come from a growth mindset rather than a victim mindset and use their experiences to not only better their own lives but help trade works for other people. Have you got any real life examples of experiences that you've been through that you found have helped you better help others but also connect with them and sort of enhance growth within yourself? So, so there's always two, two good screens to mind uh, for me. I was, uh, I think I alluded to, I was very sort of, I, I went to Spain and failed, so to speak. And I was like, God, I didn't make it in Spain, so I came back and I was all depressed. And so I went to the gym, started getting results, and then about a year later, I was like, right. In fact, I was speaking to my brother and I was bemoaning, I was bemoaning uh, my circumstance. And uh, <laughs> this is, I had two brothers. And my eldest brother, he said to me, he got so annoyed about it, he goes, look, he goes, why don't you just go to Australia? And you're always talking about going to Australia. Then. He goes, in fact, I don't want to know that answer. He goes, don't talk to me about this again until you buy the flight. I don't want to hear it. So anyway, I was like, oh, fair enough. So, uh, <laughs> for the second session, next day I went, bought the flights. Very well. I was like, you know, Australia. He was like, what did I tell you? And I said, bought the flights, right? And uh, so when I got to Australia, I was, uh, you know, you get to stay here six months, but I was an immigrant. Uh, I mean, I'm proudly 30, and uh, I have to go and get a job. And so at that point, you would have been in some ways, I don't have many people back home uh, telling me, oh, that's a dumb move, what are you doing now? You, know, you should be career and all this. Proud of the bucket. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, yeah. proud of the bucket. Yeah. Get up. Uh, and I ended up working in reception, and I went to, and, it was really good actually, I have to handle myself this because I, I've handled things so many times the wrong way. So this is one of the things I did do. When I was flying over, I think about it so, so, so long, but I never forget, I was, it was dawn, dusk, in the morning, and I was flying over the continent of Australia and it was just massive redness, so it's like, like something on the front page of a National Geographic. Yeah. And I saw it, I looked down and I made myself this promise, which I sit. Uh, fail, but I maintained a promise for a few years, and that was, I was like, you've tried, uh, let's look at this up chair. you've tried being negative, being down, blaming others, bemoaning your situation, being good, right? you've tried that extensively, we have tested those avenues, and they haven't served you, so now, you're going to look positive, you're going to look on the bright side, you're going to actually start applying all those books that you've been reading and, and, and putting off, actually taking action by just reading, reading. You know. So when I got there, I thought, okay, fine. And I went and got, a, the first thing I thought was, I've got to go to the gym. My mate was like, do you want to go to the rocks? Go see the bridge. I've got to go to the gym. I haven't changed for 48 hours. And that was my only thing, that was my first thing that I was like, I've, I've, I've achieved goals. Mm. So I became very attached to the gym. Went to the gym, and then I thought, and then I saw a job, a job for a receptionist at the gym. I thought I could get free membership here. So I went rent this job, 12 hours a week, less than my rent. Went there, 30 people there, all girls, just me. Somehow I got this job, got this job as a receptionist. Uh, and uh, then I started, I started noticing people coming in, I talked to them about their training because I was passionate about training. You had an interest? Yeah. And they started to sign up. So when I was on, more people signed up. Long story short, I eventually got made sales manager. And my uh, former employer's name is Jacob Hayes, one of the first guys to uh, get fitness professional of the year in Australia back in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, very much invested in me, believed in me. But I knew that my outcome of staying in this country was going to be linked with the success of this gym. Um, and so that was something that was really pivotal to, pivotal to me. So part of the experience of someone going around the gym would be, you know, going and seeing the changing room, seeing the toilets. So I would be there every morning. I'd go in. One of the first things, and even to this day, I judge a place like this. I would go and check the toilets there because it really says something about management and how they feel. And I think um, I've said before, uh, we, we, you know, you work at uh, your business uh, operations uh, from within the EMF, right? right. The right. military fitness. Yes. That place is sparkling clean. Yeah. It's always been clean. It's one of the first things I said to my uh, girlfriend when we went there. And so I would be there cleaning the toilets every morning to make sure they were sparkling because it was an aging facility. 
because I knew it was linked. And not, not only did, not, not did I sit there and go, this is a begrudge that I, I didn't begrudge it. I was thankful for it because I had the opportunity. And so if I'd been born in Australia, I was living in Australia, um, I might have been going, look, I'm the manager of this place. I shouldn't have to clean the toilets. But because of the frame and the experience and the positivity I decided to harness, which was against my innate nature, um, I recognised that that was going to be linked to my prosperity here I am 10 years later. Um, so that was one of the, the first things that started to change my, my views on uh, you know, friends and stuff like that. Uh, the second thing was that I then got everything I wanted, I got my residency, everything was great, life was, I was living in Bondi, and uh, I, uh, my, I get a call. I get a call out in sort of late in the evening, and missed a call, and I rang back, rang the UK, this is very odd, I had a very bad feeling about it, and I don't, I'm told my brother's just died, there's been an accident, He's died in a motorcycle accident. Is your old brother? My oldest brother, the one who encouraged me to, uh, to come over to Australia in the first place. And my parents said, not that I'm not dwelling, but my parents, my parents uh, divorced, were separated when I was nine. Um, and and uh, my dad, a road chap that he is, uh, is very much a man of the old world. This Argentinian guy, they went to school, this sort of thing. So he had a different way of being. But so in some ways, my eldest brother was, became sort of a de facto father as well. You know, he went very much like he was eight years old. And so all of a sudden, uh, this has happened. And, and I, I remember, uh, I'll obviously never forget that day, but that was when, that was, that's, that's been the biggest obstacle in my life. Because even though outwardly, what's interesting is nobody knew that I had a brother in the first place. And I didn't tell anyone. So I would turn up to work, and the, I told my boss, because I had to fly out to his funeral. Uh, but I went out and I put this grey face, grey face on, and I basically uh, uh, carried on. I didn't cancel clients. I didn't let my shifts go. I never did that. And so there's an element of me that's quite proud of that. Uh, I flew back. I gave him eulogy. I did. I did the things that I, I needed to do. And and, and there's an element of me of me that recognises that I didn't um, necessarily allow myself to go through the natural process of uh, grieving. Of yeah. uh, I felt so I thought I should be strong, um, but that changed everything. Uh, that changed everything, and it's not a, not a silver lining way. So um, I don't. I, I strongly don't believe. You know, if you know, someone says to me, "Oh, everything happens for a reason," I almost want to slap them in the face. You know, so why did that happen? <laughs> Well, so that you don't go around saying stupid stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now you remember that. And now you're going to turn the other cheek. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Something uh, is that a defensive law? I don't know. You just said it, did so, Well, maybe. Yeah. But this is true. nothing from that. I, I don't go, oh, thank God, that happened. Of course not. I would do anything to it, but you can't. So you can only be, you can only, and yeah, you can't be the old you. Forget about it. It's not that you bounce back and you, you know, you're resilient and you can oh, handle it. No. You are a different person. Maybe, uh, and that wiped me out for a few years. I was very, very bad about that. Um, but what I recognised for so long, for seven or eight years, that since then, is that when people have true, true sadness in life, so I've actually had people who, who, who brothers have died, and people write to me and say, so I read about, so I, I have written about it, I read about what happened, or I've seen this. Uh, you know, and last week my brother died. And I know what to say. Uh, I know what to say because I've had that experience. So I interviewed Dean Mark, the former captain of Australia, uh, Wallabies, um, the other day, and he has, um, his wife has a condition. And basically they lost um, four out of their five children um, to complications of premature birth and all this. And, um, really quite sad, uh, sad stuff, incredibly uh, sad. But in the interview with him, I was able to communicate with him. Even though I haven't had that, I have had the experience of loss. I have had the experience of seeing the devastation of my parents. I have had the thing, that experience of feeling that your, your, your happiness will be forever tainted. 
I've had that, so I can see it in others, and I can relate. I wish I didn't have that skill because of the way I got it, but I, but I have it now. But these two things uh, have changed the change me, changing my life for the better. Coming over to Australia, showing me something, and then that does take lots trauma basically. Also, but these are the two pivotal things I've done so far. So it's having that, um, that empathy to be able to connect with people and that understanding from that. The ability uh, and the definition of the to put oneself in the other person's shoes, if you will, or in that position and know how or be able to ascertain how they may be feeling. And then through that, having a better understanding of how to communicate, how to help, how to resolve, if you will, which is a time thing. And there's a fable that we mentioned earlier where it's the framing, what we don't know about whether something's great or good, and I think you said it was sort of a Zen print or something, and some people will be familiar with it, and it's the fact that there's a wise man on the farm, and he has some horses, and the horse runs away, and someone says, oh, that's terrible, and he says, well, we don't know yet, we don't know whether it's for the good or the bad, and a couple of days later, Four horses return and he has more horses. And then the next week the son breaks his arm. He said, Oh, it's terrible. He breaks his arm riding a horse. Yeah, 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 yeah that's yeah, it. That's riding right. a horse. That's yeah, it. Taming yeah, the horses. Yeah. Yeah. Taming it. Because, yeah. oh, no, that's it's terrible. Like, we don't know. It's good for the bad yet. And then, you know, the week later they recruit the army. And because his son's got a broken army, then he's no use to them. <laughs> and, uh, and so on and so forth. So again, it's that whole, you just don't know. And sometimes at the moment, something can seem devastating, but then it's not that something good came out of it because the instance itself may have not been good, but the outcome of where it led to might have been more desirable because of that instance, which is quite thought-provoking within itself and uh, erroneous, if you like, to some degree. Mm. I mean, yeah, and it doesn't always have to be, like, being in this home. Mm. It doesn't have to be major trauma. Trust me, you want to avoid those things. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, um, don't seek out <laughs> trauma. But yeah. discomfort is good. But yeah, yeah you don't want to um, savage trauma. No, or, uh, no, you don't. And you don't uh, want uh, to uh, court uh, it. Uh, and it doesn't. Be, the idea is that you uh, a if if you are fortunate enough to live long enough, then you are going to see these things happen in your life. And so when you are there, when these things happen, it's going to be how you respond to them. And so, when you look at your general health um, and, and, and you know general happiness, I guess um, you want building your resilience is about making you your, your less susceptible to being derailed, that making you more able to weather life storms. This is what this is the promise. Um, and so, if someone's like, "Oh God, you know, Alex, I feel all terrible and awful," you might say, "Look, come and train. Stop looking after your diet and nutrition." You start to realize that those two things are very important. But also, what about these other things? You know, do you have friends? Do you have a goal that you believe in? You know, do you sleep? Do you, you know, what's your relationship like with your parents? All of these things actually start to add up to make a more resilient uh, in, in, individual. So the reason I like it is because it's, it's the offense. It's not, I may have burnt out, so you should go to Bali for two weeks. That's great, but that's like, oh my God, what happened to me, so I have to do this. What would be better would be to, to have preempted that in the first place, make sure we go to Bali every six months for a week on the, on the offense. Do you, know, do you know what I'm saying? I do. I like that a lot. But uh, that definitely strikes a chord with me. Prevention is better than cure, and balance is a large part of resilience, and building and integrating that within one's life. I mean, there's plenty of examples of that whether it's in the physical realm or a business realm, and looking at the, not just equality, or equality I should say, but also addressing those key areas, where, because we are all different, that's part of the fun, that's what makes coaching and life and everything else interesting, is that we are all different, and some of us are gonna be better in X area, and some of us are gonna be better in Y area, but then to identify areas where it might be lacking, builds a more well-rounded and resilient person if you like, and you use the term there I want to highlight again is derail because there is always a storm going and people use a 
term weather. So I, I will start this day. I will start when. I will start after. There's always a birthday. There's always a funeral, unfortunately. There's always an event. There's always something. Tomorrow becomes never. So. Yeah, tomorrow yeah. never comes. You've got to learn to, you know, basically swim in the storm because it's never going to be smooth sailing as far as I'm concerned. And if you think that it is, you're going to set yourself up for success. Another good saying that I love is expect the best, prepare for the worst. Because mm -hmm. inevitably at some point the shit will hit the proverbial fan <laughs> yeah. and it will cause a shit storm. Yeah. But as you said, it's not about going, cool, it didn't even affect me like a, a fly flipping off. It's, no, I have the skill set and the character to better deal with this to, rather than completely going off the rails. Yeah. And that I could still hold it together somewhat yeah. and keep my faculties together and whatnot with you know, friends and relationships. Because showing weakness is not uh, a bad thing or, or showing vulnerability, it's a strength of anything. Mm -hmm. It's a character of great leaders of such. Um, so to segue through this now and a little bit more on resilience, we've touched on a little bit about yourself, what you've done, your past, a couple of clients you've worked with. Can you talk to us about now some sort of current projects, where you're at, where you want to go, what you're trying to do now for you know the people and the clients that you're in touch with in the world in regards to resilience? Well, what, what you just said as well, I really like about preparation. Resilience basically is preparation. Um, so, the, and, and I think in the army they, they call it Four, four, well, depends whether you want the, the team version, but the four P's. Uh, That's explicit. Oh, five, five. It's a proper plan and prevent this poor performance. Yes, uh, I'm familiar with it. Yes. Um, uh, and indeed, you know, in, in, in the US Army, they teach, uh, they have this thing called MRT, which is Master Resilience Training. Deliberate Resilience Training. And, uh, and it, look, I've said it before. Is that like when. Uh, just the armor like the SAS and you see them do all Both. Yeah. Both. In fact, in the elite military forces in NATO, uh, New Zealand, uh, the British RAF and Navy, and also uh, to 300,000 US personnel, uh, active US personnel, uh, are trained in, in uh, Master Resilience Training. It's part of their combat ready fitness course. So that's not exercise and all that. That's actually things like mindfulness, a thing called very American, hunt for the good stuff. So looking at Positive, so if you actually reflect on what's good in your life, that can actually develop resilience. So it's just about being grateful, it's grateful and stuff. But you know, for that might be, you know, oh, I've got my hubby and my family or whatever it is, that's cool for them. Um, and uh, just before a segue on, on to what you were talking about, the other thing was is that, again, it's not just trends or buzzwords, right? I mean, they've been, they've been uh, investigating this uh, since uh, the, after the war. And, um, what they found after the war, which was really interesting because you had this mass migration of people and you've never seen such documented trauma of people returning um, from the war. And do you know, when they, the um, University of Columbia did studies, uh, studies on this, um, where they showed that more or less one third of the population was basically inoculated against post traumatic stress disorder, which means following September 11th, following World War II, you have all these people come out with post traumatic stress. But normally, there's at least one, in fact, normally considerably more, but at least one third of people are not affected by it like that. They don't exhibit the same quote, they still feel sadness. And this is an evolutionary mechanism that they propose to ensure that we are not all devastated. So if there are some people that are born with it, um, and they're uh, in innate genetic capability, predisposition for resilience, but that's like strength. <laughs> you know, if you've ever trained, I've trained next to a 17-year-old Maori kid in, in, in Christchurch, and it's just not fair, because he looked amazing, and that was his genetics, but it doesn't mean you can't make up for that. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, it's nothing unique. What I do now, what, given the inordinate amount of time I have as well, uh, since moving to the Gold Coast, is I've been interviewing people demonstrated uh, a remarkable ability to overcome adversity in their own lives. So I think I touched on um, Dean Mark, but I've also uh, um, interviewed uh, Commander Grant Edwards. He's, he's a 30-year uh, 
policeman in the Australian Federal Police. He's also been three times Australia's strongest man. And um, so it's a massive, tight, towering, huge bloke, right? Very high up in the police. Um, and he was part of the first cyber crime unit, where it was just like the Wild West days of the internet. And so this was before they had any uh, psychological training or, or support. And he saw just thousands of hours of child porn, basically, Peter Fidio and stuff. And it, 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 it has burnt onto his mind. And, um, and he's been in Afghanistan, and he's been undercover in the uh, Captain of the Americas, which I think is a brilliant title. Um, and East Timor, seeing all this stuff, and in the end it just, it, it just got to him. And so he just recently published a book, and we, we, we sat down and spoke about that because just like sometimes you need a rich person to tell you that being rich isn't the key to happiness, he wants us as a way for you to say, well, actually, it's the only way that you would know. Because if you haven't had the experience, how would you know? Right? It's like Jim Perry always says. Yes. Right? He's like, trust me, I made the millions, it didn't make me happy. Um, so I'm just telling you. And here's this guy who's incredibly tough, physically strong, strongest man, and, and, you know, and he went to the, to the world titles uh, and everything. And, and uh, here's this guy saying, you know, I just wanted to cry, I felt like the world was coming back around me, and then what he did, that's the key, what he did. Uh, so we can't experience everything, nor would we want to experience everything. Yeah. So I look at someone like that, I look at um, next week, in fact, after this, I'm going to get an interview with someone who's a uh, lady from Nicole who's set up a community cafe. And, and a community cafe is about, uh, it's, it's about going to a, a, a real cafe and, uh, on certain days and setting it up for dementia sufferers. So they might play music from the 1960s or 50s or whatever. Uh, their carers are going to be there. And carers is like, you know, not only paid carers, but family. And so the carers have this support. The sufferers, the mention of sufferers, um, have this support. Uh, and so, in a way, this is building strength. Uh, and Nicole herself has actually overcome great amount of difficulty. I don't know backstory. Her own life, parents die, all these sort of things. It's really intrigues me when I see people who have had some sort of um, some catastrophe or ongoing catastrophes or, and, and, and have been able to recover and then create something. So good at that. Uh, it's, not, it's not turning lemons into lemonade, but it's just having, it's just that strength and how do they do it? Because you would have been, you would have, you, would have, you know, uh, you could say, oh, my dad hit me. And so I had no chance, that's why I'm in prison. Or you could be like, my dad hit me, so I knew I'd never be like my family. Yeah. And so now I work in child protection services. If you say Grant Edwards, for example, he had a quite a, a sort of sort of violent upbringing as well, and therefore ended up working in human trafficking, child exploitation. If that's it, it depends what you do with it. Um, yeah. And whether you learn the effect you negatively, or whether you use that as an excuse. And there's an example I like to give of if we're at a poker, we're at a poker table, we all got a different hand, and you can have the worst hand at the table, you can have the best hand at the table, but each hand is capable of winning or losing a game. It's what you do with it that matters. And that's where that attitude or again I think resilience comes from. And that's what the difference is. Have you got that character? Have you got that resilience to go, you know what? I'm going to do it this way, or I'm going to take in that path. And, 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 and yes, it, look, absolutely quite right. If, if you were listening to this right now, uh, if I had listened to something about this podcast, one of the things I'd be saying to myself, oh my God, that's not me. Um, and that's uh, A, we show every single person by virtue of being alive um, has overcome that uh, So that's why one of programs that I do is called Resilience Within, because it's not revealing resilience you already have. So if you're a mother, you've, come up, you've overcome serious person, just by giving birth. So if you're starting to think about re-entering the workforce, and it's, it's intimidating, think about the intimidation of the things that you've gone through already, yes. and overcome. And I think that's a growth mindset. So you start to look at, look, I have, I, 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 I feel bad about lots of things, a lot of the time. And then I'll say to myself, like an exercise, well, mate, you, you know, you did actually move countries, you said you were, you were clinically underway, um, and then within 10 years, you uh, won your division of the Australian Natural Body. Um, 
temperature. You uh, you have you know it's not about oh my god I because I have multiple examples where I'm not sharing and failing and also just behaving in a way that's not exemplary. You know, um, and you can also be resilient uh, at certain times and not at others. So you need the stressor. So there might be someone who's like, oh, the zombie's getting, he's going to be kick ass, but then might not be great at sharing his feelings. There are people who have different strengths in different areas. This is true. And, um, and resilience, um, maybe as you sort of alluded to a little bit, you think resilience could be. People think of it as a physical trait, and again, you use the example in the army, in the people think resilience, like putting a bag on your head, beating someone up, you know, getting tortured. But that perhaps is physical resilience to some way. That's also mental strength and many other traits that we can name, but it's important to realise how you, how you have phrased it there, the resilience from within, because we all have those elements. It's just extrapolating those out and perhaps emphasising them or the experiences we've already been through, then using them to combat and create more resilience, Correct. which in itself could be um, a bit of an enigma, if you will. Mm. Mm. And you know, the, the one in the military, the Master Resilience Training, they actually did it because they were recognised that in the army, it was the post-traumatic stress disorder was actually quite hard to treat once it's there. Uh, and so they train it in a way that they can train the trainer. So the parents, not only do the soldiers learn it, but they learn how to train others in it, so they can do it with their families. Yes. So if they start telling their families, it's good to have social partnership. Because what happens when you come out of the military is you know, get post-traumatic stress disorder when you're in, in the zone. And that's not just because you're focused on battle or whatever it might be. But you have all your buddies around you. You have this culture supporting you. And then they go, look, thanks for your service, mate. See you later. Here's your thing. You go sit at home. Your wife's at work. Your husband's at work, you're sitting there twiddling the thumbs, and all of a sudden, oof, this, uh, you know, it all comes back to you. So, um, yeah, it wasn't just a physical. Uh, sorry, I was talking. Yeah, I'm not talking about that, please. It's good, it's important. Uh, and then, you know, the other thing is that uh, you, you, this is the other, the other thing that's really important. So, NASA does this training as well. Mm. And NASA did it with, because, and they deliver it to, uh, believe it or not, Astronauts wow. and uh, emergency, uh, emergency, emergency medical staff, so doctors and stuff. Oh my God, the guys have their leg ripped off, you know, the other. And um, what they realise is, if you're doing a spacewalk or you, you're doing these sort of things, that you, you, they are going to uh, you can't be worrying about what's happening at home or your regrets in the past or or feeling overly stressed. So it, they do stress uh, uh, the components of their resilience training are twofold stress management and stress inoculation. And so it's very different. And this is this is where I this is really what, what, what I want. Uh, it's uh, it's important for me that you know you listen to this. We know that I'm not sitting here saying that, that I am Mr. Reserve. Although I'm very happy to adopt that nickname would be great, right? Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm grateful. I would love that, but that's just not, just uh, not the case. But they do stress management training and stress inoculation training. So SIT and SMT. And the, the stress inoculation training uh, is about so if if you're a kid, well no, sorry, if if I insult you and you get upset about it. You can then go off and manage those emotions. Okay, breathe, calm down, calm down, you know, whatever, whatever you might do. I'm going to go for a run, whatever. Handle the stress, handle the stress. But what, if, but what they, they, so that's one of those things. So, so, so certain stresses are just unavoidable. But the other element of it is inoculation training. It's like not, this is where you get the Buddhism and stuff like that. It doesn't affect you in the first place. It's so much easier if it just bounces off and trying to dry yourself, right? So imagine if someone, you know, insult you, and imagine if you were just for a moment that your frame of network was, man, poor man, I must have been having a really bad day, you know? And then you just go on your way. And you don't have to handle, have, have to manage all this, this awful, uh, how can you say that to me? It doesn't know me. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? And so what they, they call it stress inoculation, it's like a vaccination. 
and uh, Falcon. And so they have all sorts of cool stuff, really cool stuff. It's like they have this game where it's like a, a car game, which they play, and it all sends it up. And the lower your heart rate is, and, uh, and, and the less sweat and stuff that you, you emit, the faster the car goes. So you've got to calm yourself down to speed the car up. This is what that's about. Wow. Uh, and that's they like cool. Yeah. And they also do, and it always seems to come back to some sort of mindfulness. So you start to give that space to get. Um, if you were someone like me, so I come back from a very volatile family with South Americans, uh, that, 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 that is gold for me. I, I need to do that because I'm back, I, I react, my nature is to react emotionally to that. And, and then there's a long period afterwards. I'm like, oh my God, why did I say that? Or, you know, Billy from the third grade called me a baby. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the worry about it. It's all those little things that yeah. you know, yeah. I, I think I'd like to share this, uh, especially for the listeners. When I first came to Australia, I was working within periods of retail and hospitality, along with my training on the side. And there was an owner uh, called David of a business just around the corner from where I was working at the time called Tarot Lodge. And Tarot Lodge was more of your spiritual time. I will give you stones, your gems, the earthy elements, the jewelry, etc. Mm-hmm. And David himself was, was originally from the UK and he had spent years, uh, as I came to know him, going around doing things like you know, cold reading and, and, and psychic reading, etc. And, and the tarot cards, that's a name, and, and you know, doing jewelry and whatnot. And I went in because I'm a bit of a fan of jewellery and um, I, I like, you know, what they represent with the stones and that's just something that I personally like. And it was really interesting when I was speaking to David and I used to go in, it was always a very peaceful atmosphere. When, when, I, when I spoke to him, it was, he had that calming presence, which now I understand a little bit more, but at the time I'm like, you know, like, so he, just, he always has a good conversation, a good chat, a good story. And, you know, we used to talk about the dynamics of cold reading, what, what's real and what isn't and all that kind of you know, for my science sort of brain. And one of the best things he, he ever told, and I think taught me or made me aware of, to, to put it in better terms, is how we are all reactive. And he said to me, you know, we're all reacting all the time, everything around us, react, react, react. You know, if someone pulls out, react, we swear, you know, if someone calls us, react, if someone's late for work, react. And the challenge, he said, is to become unreactive, because when you can become unreactive, when you don't react, and you are in control of your, your, your internal locus of control, as it can be termed, is very powerful. He said the irony of that is it's super hard to do. You know, how do you become unreactive? Because there's a time and a place to react, you're getting attacked and react. Well, they're normally very obvious. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's, it's like, well, you someone saying your car space is not that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? It's that fight or flight SMS, yeah. just knowing when. Yeah. But, but, but he said, you know, we're all, we're all, sh- all sh- again, we're all stressed, we're all stressed out. He said, if you could just learn to become unreactive, which would be much more of a calm, relaxed person, would be much more enjoyable in life, things yeah. will bounce off. And you can see it from the different perspective, as you rightly said. If someone snaps at you, you don't know that someone in their family could have passed away. This uh, that morning. Now, that does not give them the right to snap. That's not what we're getting at. But I think the point is, you just don't know what someone else is going through. That's and then you are, we are only in control of what we can control. If we focus on what we can control, our life, we are more than inclined to be in control. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a you know, juxtaposing term, if you like. But when we focus on those things that we can't, it's just a waste of our energy and we yeah. become very erratic. Uh, and again, to be able to use that term again. So I think it's interesting, it's a good point that you make. A couple more questions before we, we fly sure. into some of the light-hearted ones, before we wrap it up, just because I'm going to be respectful of your time. Um, is, if, if you could go back and speak to your younger self now, mm. and you only had a minute, what a couple of, uh, what are the, the things you'd say, or a couple of things, or points, key points that you'd make to yourself? Only a couple of minutes. What, what age? Uh, uh, if you could talk to yourself at 25, let's say. Oh, uh, God, that's so great. Uh, the, the first thing I would say, absolutely, is brother, you've got so much time. I made so many decisions that I, I felt because I was concerned about the judgments of others. And I'm like, by this time, I should hold off. And, you know, 25, you're only a quarter of the way into the game. 
Um, and so I wish I, if I had said that, I would, I would def definitely have gone for loads of time. Um, and that, um, and so cliche, you've actually really got to keep in fit. Don't look for the vessel that's going to allow you to do the thing you want to do. Do the thing that you want to do. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So some people will like, I did this, but I could do that. I worked in this business, and I could do that. Or, uh, but I think you should just go and do that for a paint, start painting. Take, 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 the, take the hits. Like, uh, in the last two years, so I look, I like resilience as, as a subject because it brings people, uh, it, 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 I think it puts a good frame on what you can do to improve your uh, existence. Um, but the truth, the, the deeper thing is this, 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 the sharing of people's stories. And I want to know why people live the way they do and how we can live better. And so I never thought that I would, um, you know, I love documentaries and, and I love talking like we're doing now. But I never thought I could do that, so I never did that. But then two years ago I wrote a script and I've shown you this and, and, and we have a documentary called Live Differently. Which, uh, which is coming out um, hopefully next year. And mm -hmm. uh, we're just showing it to networks now. Very uh, I could have done that a decade ago, but I didn't. And, and so, if, yeah, maybe a little bit more over that minute. But that's what I'd say to him. I, I'd definitely say that. Um, that you've got loads of time. Even if you're 50, you've got loads of time. So, yeah, that's what I'd tell my younger self. It's always a, it's an interesting. A thought process to be able to go back in time and speak to oneself. Oh, what would I say? And go to the gym. I was going to say as well. God, yeah, yeah. Go to yeah. the gym. Yeah. Yeah. This is going to be like so much easier. Well, on that yeah. question before you probably say, if you've got limited time, it's like, well, what am I going to? What are the? Because I've heard the question be like this. Imagine yourself in ten years. What do you think you'll tell you to them? Well, that's and that's another. Because if you're looking at yourself and you go, you know, twenty-five for you, that's not very long ago. Yeah. But for me, that's uh, 10, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. Give um, so I'm only yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it. But thirteen, so in thirteen years I'll be fifty. Right? And that's nothing. Nothing wrong with fifty, but I don't want to be sitting back going, man, you're only thirty seven, man. <laughs> yeah, you've done loads. Well that's it. Um, you can always go, ah, oh, yeah, and it's that hindsight again, right? It's that yeah. oh, when I put it, it's like well we're present, make the most of them now, so, which I think we'll all get to. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I would really, that's what I keep trying to remind myself so, mm -hmm. on a daily basis. And, and some more now transitioning into some more lighthearted questions mm -hmm. to my guests. These are a bit more lighthearted, so they're a little bit of fun. So before we go into our final questions, always, what's your favourite food? Ben's favourite food. If you had one last meal, what would it comprise of? I oh, yeah. love the fact this is, this is, yeah, this is a very, I'm a very complicated relationship with food. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, I guess I, it would be, um, I, like, I like pancakes. I've always liked pancakes. It was the first thing I taught myself how to cook. Like flock crepes, you know, French style, the lemon, oh, sugar. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, pancake there? Yes, pancake there. Pancake cheese. Uh, yeah, yeah, they don't have that anywhere else. For all you Australian listeners, <laughs> we need to create a pancake day. There's every other day, day right? Put, put your votes forward. I'm happy to send yeah. it. And we'll just, we'll create a trend. Yeah, that, that would be, um, that would be. Yeah. Uh, what about sweet tooth? That's sweet tooth. Sweet tooth. I can, I can, uh, I can understand. I can relate. Very much the same. If you choose a superpower, what would it be? Why? Superpower. Uh, I, I. <laughs> this is going to reveal all things about. If I could have any superpower, I think it would be. Can I play time control? You can have whatever you like. Imagine that. Right? This Imagine is no constraints. If you could do time control, this is, and it, it's incredibly egotistical, oh, right? I could therefore be like the world's greatest at insert anything. Because say you go play football, you 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 you, you kick off, you go left, guy left, you just rewind five seconds, and you go right. And you do that, and you become basically, you remember the Maradona where he runs around all the English guys, oh, yeah. and English players in the schools, yeah. you know, that you could be like that forever, people would be writing, writing about you, and they'd be like, not only did he do that, he invented this quantum physics, oh, you can, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. he was also the best tennis player in the world, um, well, he never ever not got a strike at bowling, <laughs> it's just go on and on, it would, you know? and you'd, be, you'd be living a very long life, pausing and rewinding. 
Well, there is that. Yeah. Play it. But I like to think of you would you you revert back to your energy, energetic state, you know, so that you would never full time. Right. But there would be danger of probably running back trying to change everything. <laughs> you might go back again and rewrite it. Interesting. <laughs> Would you go to go forward at some point? Ooh. It is interesting. Yeah. yeah. But that, I wouldn't because like, there's a danger that you could not realise you were going to die. <laughs> you could skip forward and be like, man, at the end of the table. So, yeah. And that, that, that in itself is uh, an interesting thought yeah. process, isn't it? But that would be a good, that would be a really good. Uh, well, that, the, other one, the other one would have been, yeah. which would just have been fabulous, would be to know all languages. Because I think it was Nelson Mandela. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, imagine that. No one has come up with that. Yeah. There, there is, if you speak to a man in a language that he understands, you speak to his head. But if you speak to an, a, a man in his own language, you speak to his heart. And uh, Nelson Mandela said that. That's a yeah. uh, And you know, he learned Afrikaans from his Afrikaans, J.O.O. And they became very close friends and all of this. And so there is something to be said. You go to Bali tomorrow and you start. Um, Speaking about Hassan or Indonesia, you know, you will they'll respond to you so much better. So, well, it is because you're connecting with them on a different level. Yeah. You know, when you can speak someone's language, and that's where the phrase comes from. Are you speaking my language? So, yeah. Like yeah. No one's yeah. that. Um, that's a really good one. Uh, yeah, it's a good one. one. Um, it, the last part about the, the time manipulation that segues onto one of the other questions is: Do you believe there's life after death? Do you believe we die? Do you believe there's something else? Do you believe there's something more? Well, I've definitely given it a lot of thought. I, I, I've gone all the way from, look, when you go, you go, you won't feel better, um, to the incomfortable odds that you are here, something like 400 trillion to one to be, you know, inception and stuff, um, to the idea that um, if you think effectively time is infinite, uh, you know, the old Big Bang, this happens, you know, like the Big Bang happens and it reconstructs and stuff. Then there's possibly infinite possibility for you to reoccur. I just don't know. I like to think that there is. Uh, I also, uh, yeah, I like to think that there is. I feel that there's something going on. Um, there's more to it than we realize. I don't think it's going to be. Some, some um, Father Christmas looking character up there something going, no, you yeah. can't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you, oh, yeah, oh, you, no. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's going to be like that, but I think there's probably something. What do you think? Well, like yourself, I think there's something more. I'd like to believe there's something more, but then part of my brain, the more rational, the more logical, the more scientific, if you says to me that once the body is degenerated and it is deceased, it is that of dead, the batteries are out. I don't know what it feels like, etc. I don't know what happens, but we you know when you degrade, you know, the body begins to disintegrate over time. Um, but as I go through life, I understand more of the spiritual element, and then you look at things like quantum physics and whatnot, mindfulness, and you think, well, perhaps the body dies, but perhaps the soul or the mindfulness can translate to another parallel. I don't know, this is just me bantering around ideas, but I think at the end of the day it comes down to the fact that just like a good film, just like a good movie, just like a good anything, a love life, an experience, a job, is part of us that just doesn't want it to end. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's where my mind frame is at the minute. Yeah. With with what life as life, as I, as I, I have experienced it thus far, mm. is where my mindset is at. That will probably, you know, ha has changed and will progress yeah. as, I, as I grow older and, and experience more. And now on to my, my last question, which I ask them, I guess. Can you share and identify with us uh, a fear that you've had, uh, something that you were very fearful of, something that you had to overcome? And what you learned from that experience, what you've taken out of that. Like yeah. literally, like, uh, yeah. Well, well, it can be anything physical, mental, anything, any sort of adversity, anything, anything that you had great fear of or was made you very fearful of you overcome it and what you've learned from that experience. I mean, 
I guess the, although I'm not there, <laughs> um, I, my, great, my greatest fear, which I still have, uh, but I, which I will not allow to manifest, is mediocrity. And there is nothing wrong with mediocrity in, in and of itself, uh, but I just can't have that. Uh, and so the, the more, the further I go down the rabbit hole of life, uh, because I, I've had an incredible amount of, of probably unresourceful uh, self-reflection, where I've gone, well, why didn't you do this, or if only you'd done that, all those sort of things. Um, you know, I should have been a carpenter. <laughs> it would have made my life so much easier that it would never have been unemployed. That wasn't my, that wasn't my destiny. Like Noah. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, well, pretty much. It looked like that. <laughs> It's not the one that I was going for. No, I was going for like Ragnar Lothman. Oh, you have more than I do. Yeah, well, the Nordic gods, yeah. <laughs> um, old uh, time. <laughs> yeah, old time, yeah. Uh, uh, is, is, that's, that's, that's the fear to have, uh, and again, it's, I'm, I'm not the originator of this concept, because I think man has been thinking about this since a long time, but I don't want to look back on my life and go, oh, I could have done more. Uh, I would rather look at the extreme rather than go straight down the middle. You know, when I've heard people say before, I say, well, why were you an accountant? Nothing wrong with being an accountant. But I'll say something such an English thing to say. Like, oh, well, you know, it paid the bills. Well, I wasn't here to pay the bills. Damn it. And I'm not going to be here just to pay the bills. I'd rather be living in, in, in the outback in my own home and, 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 and fishing in the local creek and, and overcoming adversity and being lonely than to lead, lead a medium. Uh, that's my, my great fear, and, and, and in every stage of, of where I am, I keep moving. So yeah, I, I born in Brunei. I, I, I went to boarding school in Malaysia. Uh, I went to boarding school in the UK. I moved to Spain. I moved to Australia. I keep moving. I moved from Sydney. Uh, I'm living in the mountains at the moment up in the Gulf Coast. And, uh, and everyone's like, wow, I can't believe you did that. Wow, I can't believe you did that. But I just cannot spin my wheels and live an uh, unadventurous life as defined by me. That's what, that would kill me, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, that's my greatest fear that, that I keep trying to overcome by doing that, that scares me all. That one would say you can't do. A constant evolution. Yeah, hopefully. Lots of backward steps. <laughs> <laughs> so always backwards to go forwards and there's a few side steps and diagonal. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a beautiful way to uh, end the conversation. Ben, before we go, where can people find more about you if they want to learn more, if they want to reach out and get in contact and follow your journey and also uh, the upcoming um, documentary on resilience, etc. Yeah, so we have um, my website, bensarabia.com. Um, that's S A R A V I A, Spanish, bensarabia.com. Um, that's okay. where I just plug that now. Uh, and the other one's Live Differently. Uh, but Live Differently, you'll see it when it comes out. You know, we, we, we have a uh, livedifferently.com.au, and the reason I, I, I just bring that up is if you had a story of an un unorthodox life, uh, uh, doing things differently, living differently, in a way that's unique to, to us, and just drop us an email, because we're just always looking out for people who've got a great story share it and you know, maybe come and sit down and video you and explore it. Fantastic, fantastic. I will certainly put all those links as well in the description below as always so for people who want to reach out to Ben, find out more about him, follow the journey, keep your eyes peeled, click down in the links below as always. Ben, thank you for your time, I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming in live in the new studio. Absolutely. Love that. Love it. And um, as always, guys, thank you for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe, you share this one if you got a lot out of it. And we will be back, as always, next week with another episode. So in the meantime, as always, stay fearless.